Welcome to this lesson on Not Waving But Drowning by Stevie Smith. Um, I don't know where to start with this poem. <laughs> it's quite a sad poem, so definitely read it if you haven't already. Make sure you read it aloud to yourself. It's really short, so maybe read it a couple of times just to get yourself familiar with the sound of it, the language, the imagery, that kind of thing. Even though it's a pretty sad poem, I don't necessarily interpret it as having a sad message. So I think one thing you want to do with your essays on this one is just like kind of talk about how even if we engage with difficult ideas or sad kind of happenstances in life, it doesn't mean that the outcome has to be negative. So I feel like it's a highly tragic poem, but the outcome is positive. And that will give you a kind of layered analysis as well. It will help you get extra kind of detail and extra different angles of interpretation into your essays which is always something that you want if you're aiming for those higher levels. So um, yeah pause me read the poem aloud to yourself and when you're ready we're going to jump into the vocab. So the first, there's not really loads of complex vocab here. It's generally quite simplistic, the register, um, because it kind of, it gives us like quite a basic approach to quite a difficult problem, really. Um, but the two things that I noticed that might, you maybe won't understand what they mean is uh, firstly, the phrase poor chap. This is just quite an old fashioned expression and it just means poor guy or poor man. Um, so it shows that the speaker feels sorry for the man in the poem. And the other one is larking. So a lark is a kind of bird, but if you're larking around, or you're a larking type person, or you lark, <laughs> this verb, it kind of means to mess around, to play, um, to sort of take life not very seriously in, in, in a kind of jokey way. So um, if there's like a class clown in your school, or um, you're the kind of person who likes to be the centre of attention and that kind of silly, that sort of larking around. So it's, it's quite a positive um, word overall. So firstly, the story is not too hard. I've kind of, I've not even bothered really to split it into stanzas here because it's, um, it's all kind of one continuous idea, even though there are three distinct stanzas. The final stanza is slightly different, so we'll have a look at that in a second. But yeah, essentially, it's a narrative poem, so it tells a story. And it's a story about a man who drowned. He was signaling to people that needed, that he needed help, but they don't really understand him when he's signaling. So they just kind of think he's, he's joking around like he always does. So they think he's waving rather than drowning, which is obviously where the title comes from and why that line is repeated. So the people that could help him do nothing because they misinterpret his gestures. That's really central as a concept to this poem. We're going to come back to that later. So he has a reputation for larking, um, which is one justification for why he's not taken seriously. And in the final stanza, it kind of is a bit more reflective. And it, instead of it being about the act of the man drowning, it kind of zooms out a little bit and just reflects on the whole situation and how that happened. So the speaker tells us that it was always too cold for him, suggesting that his life, you know, he felt cold or he didn't feel enough or he um, felt kind of, if you feel cold, you're sort of uncomfortable, you're not in a, a nice place, really. You're not feeling cosy and warm and happy. So it's kind of metaphorical there and it's suggesting struggle and difficulty in this man's life. And we learn that the speaker also feels similar to this man. I call her she. It's not 100% sure that it's necessary that it's a she. You could interpret it as a male speaker. Because it's a female poet, I kind of interpret the speaker as female. But speakers are never exactly the same as the poet themselves. So feel free to interpret that how you like. So basically, she feels like she understood this man and she feels a connection to him and she also feels in her life that she's um, kind of drowning in this metaphorical sense and she's too far out for people to understand how she feels. So it switches between he and I. I interpret that the I of the poem when it's saying I was not waving but drowning or whatever as the speaker herself. Some other 
kind of analyses that I read on it online interpret that as the man. So you might have been taught if you study this poem that the I is the voice of the man. Um, that's just a kind of double meaning. So again, draw on that. You're welcome to talk about both of those possible interpretations in your essay because that will get you that double perspective, high level type thing. Um, or choose whichever you prefer. I think I prefer it personally as um, the speaker is talking about herself at that point. So she's a third person narrator. She's telling the story of the man um, using the third person pronoun he and him. So it talks about this kind of tragic ending to this man's life and it shifts in certain part, parts of the poem, so the, the end of the first stanza and the end of the last stanza, to first person, and I, like I said, interpret that as being about herself and drawing parallels between the speaker and her own situation and what happened to this man. There's a sympathetic tone, so this is when, when it says poor chap, basically, it shows that the speaker feels sorry for the man and that she can empathise with the man make sure that you understand this word empathy and you know you know what it means how to use it because i think empathy is one of the main kind of messages we can draw from this um from this poem it's like where you can actually place yourself in the shoes of someone else and understand how they're feeling from their point of view rather than just observing um you know observing everything from how you feel so empathy is a really important as a side note <laughs> really important skill to develop for life. Always kind of focus on your, uh, you know, improving your own empathy, um, being really sensitive to, to friends and family and helping people out when they're having difficult times will enhance empathy. Um, having pets and looking after animals or having maybe like younger kids that you look after, that kind of thing will also enhance empathy. So there's loads of ways to increase that feeling in your life. But um, I think one of the really important messages in this poem that we can take away and use in our own lives is that we should all focus on empathy and practice that skill a bit more in ourselves because that creates a kind of better world for everyone without trying to be too soppy. <laughs> um, yeah, so attitudes then, opinions that we can interpret. I actually, when I was writing this, I came up with loads and I had to sort of stop myself because I was like, whoa, that's too many. Um, so you might find more attitudes than I've put here, but I'm going to just try and go through the ones that I feel are like the main important um, attitudes in the poem. An attitude is like an opinion that is present in the poem. So the first one is um, that humour can sometimes be a cover up or coping mechanism for depression. And you actually see this with really famous comedians or comedic actors. Um, a lot of them struggle with depression or with kind of an unstable identity or sense of self and humour is a way for them to sort of cope and still enjoy life even if they feel sad. So it doesn't mean everyone who is funny is depressed but it does mean that certain people can both be funny and depressed at the same time. So if someone's a class clown or they're, um, you know, they're a jokey happy person or they like being the center of attention and they like kind of creating fun social environments it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be depressed so i think sometimes people wouldn't wouldn't really understand that without reading something like this poem or having direct experience of someone who is like that so it's quite an interesting poem i find because it really it's quite personal in that way and it, it helps us to understand different types of personalities that we might encounter in life, maybe in ourselves as well. Like if you're not that I want to make you depressed at all, uh, definitely not because, you know, it's it's better to be sort of having a, a stable sense of character. But if you're a kind of jokey, happy person who's always quite fun or maybe you're sarcastic and stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're happy all the time. Um, so you might want to explore that within yourself if you can identify with this type of emotion or this type of character. So another thing um, that's important, so a lot of this is about getting us to understand mental health problems, um, understand depression. I feel like it's a very important poem for modern society and that she's generally a really good poet for this. So do read more of her stuff if you find this like an interesting poem like I do. 
Um, so one thing she's explaining or exploring here is that if you're in a state of depression, which anyone can be, um, some people, you know, have more of a predisposition towards it or things might happen in their life that make them more depressed, but it can happen to anyone at any point and um, it's not a permanent state of being as well. But there's certain things that you feel like doing most of the time and when you're depressed, you don't feel like doing them or certain ways you might feel about yourself or your friends or your life um, that shift if you're in a state of depression. So one thing that she's um, exploring here is that depression feels like you're far away. So she just uses this quite general metaphor of being far away. So in this case, the, the man who's drowning is far away from the shore where the people are. And it's either a lake or the sea, we're not really sure. It doesn't actually matter because it's the metaphor is still the same regardless. Um, so that's like a kind of physical distance, but there's different ways you could um, you could interpret this, this sense of far away. And again, this is something that you can really get your teeth into and explore in an essay. And that would give you a really mature, really high level, sophisticated analysis if you were kind of confident on doing this. So firstly, it might be physical isolation. People with depression sometimes can um, just not feel like going out or, you know, hanging around people or um, doing much because it's, it's just difficult for them when they're in that state of mind. So physically, they might be separate from their social group or their family or people that matter that could help them. In another way, it might be that they can't let people in. So this is kind of more going back to that kind of humor class clown type thing. Um, a class clown, if you hear me say that and you're like, what is that? Just Google what that means, class clown. It's basically like the kind of, we, we've all had them. Um, I used to find them really entertaining. I wasn't a class clown. I really kind of wish I would have been, but I wasn't cool enough at school to be, to be a class clown. But it's kind of like the sort of person who is, is kind of jokey and makes the, the learning environment more enjoyable and entertaining. Um, and the, usually a class clown is someone that the teacher finds really funny as well as the students. So it, that kind of character that facilitates a kind of fun school environment. So yeah, these types of people who are depressed, um, even if they're physically present, so say uh, you have a friend who's depressed, they might go out into um, you know to the town or to the cinema or whatever with you and the rest of your social group but they might not be able to let people in emotionally or let them in psychologically and be honest with them about how they're feeling. I have experienced depression at different parts and different times in my life which is partly why I feel like this is such a good poem because I've I kind of empathize both with that man and the poet herself. Um, yeah, and I feel like it's quite accurate to how I personally felt when I was going through those bouts of depression that like I, I would actually be really social, but at the same time, I kind of feel like I, w I was only kind of being half myself and I wasn't being fully honest with people about how how I felt because um, it was maybe too intense or too sad and I didn't want people to have a bad time and like <laughs> I didn't want to moan to them about how I was feeling. So. I'd go out and I kind of laugh and joke and, and enjoy myself, but in my inner self, I would feel kind of um, quite deeply sad or quite deeply kind of different from how everyone else seemed to be at the time. So that idea of not letting people into your kind of deeper, more personal, more difficult feelings is also relating to this idea of far away as I see it here. Um, the reason I talked to you about my own experience with depression is just because the way that I've interpreted this is going to be linking to my personal experience. So um, maybe you've experienced depression as well and you might see something different in it and that's totally fine. So feel free to interpret it however you feel. Or even if you haven't experienced depression, again, your interpretation is going to be difficult. So I just wanted to kind of um, sort of make it clear from like the point of view that I'm every time I interpret these lines, I'm kind of like drawing on my personal experience. Although you sort of do that with every poem anyway. So if you've read my other analyses, they're all interpreted from, you know, things that I'm, I've felt or kind of experienced in life and how that connects to the poem, which is what I really love about literature and poetry, because it's, it's sort of universal and personal at the same time. Um, yeah, so the third example then is 
that um, it might be just psychologically isolating, like you, uh, if you feel kind of depressed, you might feel like you're on a different wavelength from other people, maybe things that other people are really excited by or really in enthusiastic about or into or looking forward to. You just can't connect to that right now because your brain is on a different wavelength and it's um, your thought processes are kind of working differently to other people in your social group. So it can be psychologically isolating, physically isolating or emotionally isolating. Um, so that's a kind of like three layered analysis of, of this attitude, which is um, the sort of thing that you'd need for like, you know, really high grade on this poem. Another attitude, death can come suddenly and unexpectedly. Even though this is kind of a frightening idea in some ways, and a lot of the poems in the Cambridge collection actually explore this idea as well. So think about which ones it connects to, like Midterm Break, for example. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing, although <laughs> you might disagree with me and you're welcome to. I kind of see it as like, a little bit of a justification for properly enjoying your life like if you you no one really knows the moment that they're going to die it, whether they're depressed or not you know something random could happen um, and obviously it's really sad if if something like that happens but it the fact that that does happen and that the world can be chaotic and random um, to me at least I try and turn that into a positive and I think about it in a way that you know you should actually just really appreciate every day that you have every positive experience that you have you should try and encourage um positivity in your life do things that you love like i love talking about poems so you know most of my my day revolves around that because i find it really energizing and and interesting so yeah it's a good underlying message and that's what i mean in a similar way to how it was at the beginning where like a negative can actually turn into a positive there's not just it's not just like bleakness and despair in this poem it's it's quite well balanced i feel so something that's really tragic about this poem is um the sort of unexpectedness of the death from the point of view of the man as well as the people who knew him so even if he decides we don't fully know if he's decided to commit suicide or if it's an accident and again i think it's deliberately ambiguous it's deliberately left uncertain but even if he did decide to commit suicide, in the act of dying, he decides to ask for help. He, something in him doesn't actually want to die at that moment. So he's not fully committing to the idea of death. And he starts signaling to people to help him, which they interpret as waving. So he's not quite ready to die yet, but he does because he's misinterpreted by others. And this is really important because I think the underlying idea of this is that um, if the other people didn't misinterpret his gestures, he could have been saved. So it's a message to all of us to be more sensitive to um, mood changes and to people that we care about and, um, you know, to help them through difficult times and to try and interpret them honestly and fully how they are and accept them rather than uh, assuming they're fine or just ignoring the like more difficult aspects of friendship or partnership that kind of thing so even though this is obviously super bleak again i find it positive and um, there's this message that we should look out for one another we should create a supportive welcoming environment um, and if we do that we might end up saving someone's life or we might at least end up making a huge positive difference in the lives of those around us so um yeah so i, I interpret it positively basically um, yeah, and that kind of links to this next point, we should care for each other, support each other through difficult times. There's this kind of underlying, like, I guess, Christian message a little bit to this poem. We'll have a look at uh, Smith's attitude to Christianity later, because she's not exactly Christian. Um, but there's this, like, do unto others as you would have done unto you. I think that's it. <laughs> Sorry if you're Christian and I've I've quoted that wrong. The The idea is that however you feel, um, you would like to be treated, treat others the same way. So it creates what we call social duty and social responsibility, this idea that as a society, if we're all kind of positively focused and we're all trying to help each other out and look out for each other, 
that entire environment then becomes a lot better and a lot more um a lot more kind of encouraging and uplifting and engaging rather than um isolating and, and frightening now, if you study in inspector calls which you maybe do or did at some point the similar messages there so you might be aware of these ideas from other things you've studied as well one thing that's i think as a final message slightly different is that um there's a there's a discrepancy between appearance and reality or expectation and reality so what we think is not necessarily what is going on with a person or with any situation so you have to be kind of open to that and aware of that and this is actually quite it sounds quite obvious but to me when i was a teenager sort of realizing this when i had like a light bulb moment and it clicked in my head it was quite um quite interesting like quite liberating for me like I felt a lot freer um I, it helped me be more sensitive to other people and their opinions uh, so I think it's a, again a really nice positive message so in this case um the man seems happy and like he's joking and having fun but actually he's drowning and he's signaling frantically for help so obviously that's a really extreme difference but it just kind of highlights that we should be sensitive to those differences between expectation and reality generally. It creates what we call a double perspective, how we think something is versus how it really is. So they're, they're quite complex, the attitudes on this one. So sorry if you're a bit like, what on earth is she going on about? Um, hopefully you kind of get those. If not, feel free to, uh, you know, download, print this document out on a scribbly, um, on the Scribbly School kind of uh, course page and uh, spend a bit longer reading through my notes on it and, you know, spend longer with the poem as well and just uh, take some time to absorb it because I'm sort of whizzing through these ideas quite quickly. So you definitely might need a bit more time to absorb this if it's not like familiar to you already. Um, yeah, so with that in mind, I'm going to jump into the language now. So we have a pitiful, sorrowful tone, kind of talked about that already but it's got kind of almost humorous and comic elements. Again, some people think that they are genuinely comic. I think that they're, they're not genuinely comic, but they're kind of almost like they could be because it's kind of in the character of the, of the man. Sorry, I'm just gonna go get my cat because she's like attacking bags. Just give me one sec. Yeah, she just, <laughs> sorry if you just heard like crinkling. Just my cat trying to get into some random bags that I have in this room. Um, <laughs> what was I saying? Yeah, so um, it's sort of absurd. Uh, things that are absurd kind of like are almost unbelievable or kind of ridiculous in a way. And obviously ri ridiculousness kind of blends into humour, but it's not quite to the point of humour as far as I'm concerned, as far as I interpret it. So we think that it's like, I feel like it's kind of um, borderline humorous, but not quite tipping over into humor. And instead, it, it kind of heightens the tragedy. You can call this tragicomic as well. So I'll just put that word there um, for people who are aiming for high levels or studying this at a level beyond GCSE. Go into, make sure you know what tragicomic is. It's a genre, so it's a type of literature that kind of balances sad and happy events. Shakespeare's particularly good at it, so you might be aware of it from Shakespeare. So I feel like it's tragicomic, um, but with a slightly heavier emphasis on tragedy. There's a lot of repetition in this poem, and I've just picked up a few of them. So some motifs, these are kind of like symbols or little images that are repeated. Um, the two that I notice really strongly, firstly, is still he lay moaning which changes to still the dead one lay moaning. And this shows us the suffering of the man. I feel like this kind of borderline uh, becomes symbolism as well. Like he is kind of a symbol of depression because even though it's a sad event about this man, we don't really know about him. We don't know his name or his circumstances. So instead of him being like a really fully fleshed out character, he's more of a symbolic character for people who have this kind of um, problem and this type of mental state and mental um, health issues in their life. 
to the idea that he's moaning after death I was I was trying to think about why this might be for a while like you know even you know the dead one lay moaning like he's he's already dead but he's still kind of showing signs of pain I think it's because he represents all people like him who are suffering so he's a he's a symbol of um depression and of um certain types of humans that suffer through it despite seeming like they don't another motif is the image not waving but drowning and i actually tried to capture this in some of the imagery that i use for this poem so if you've seen like the medium article um i found a really really sad uh photo that someone did that's really beautiful but it, it looks exactly like this like someone who's hands are sort of sticking out of the, the waves of either an ocean or lake. Um, yeah, it's an important image and it, it really sticks in my head, I think. I don't know why. I think to her, it's, um, to Stevie Smith as well, it's it's like quite uncanny. Um, I'm going to just use this word again. Like if you, again, if you're aiming for high levels, look into that word uncanny and make sure you can use it. It's a really good one to describe this type of poetry. Um, but yeah, not waving but drowning creates a circularity to the poem. It kind of keeps coming back to this same image, this moment, and it's also the title, so that gives it even more of a kind of prominence in the poem. So it's a crucial moment in that guy's life. It's a moment where outside help could have made a difference, and because he was misinterpreted, it didn't. So it kind of like just makes us focus on you know ourselves and how we can be the person that helps in that moment whether we're in a state of depression ourselves or not as well because you um you don't have to be like super okay yourself to help other people sometimes if you've struggled through something you can actually help people better because you can empathize that word that we were talking about earlier and i think stevie smith is like this as well because she um did struggle with depression and so she strongly empathizes with this man and she, I think, writes this poem so that other people can also feel compassion and empathy for these types of issues. So continuous verbs then, these are things that end in ing, basically. Moaning, waving, drowning, larking. There's a lot of them and they juxtapose, they contrast the finality of death. So there's a sense of constant movement in life and then absolute stillness in death. And that's quite important, that contrast there. She uses third person, they, um, especially the, the phrase they said, to show how they are different from him and they are different from her as a speaker. So that's quite important as well. This third person pronoun feels very distanced and very removed. And it relates back to that idea of far away that we were looking at earlier. Finally, we have metaphor. So um, the main thing is the idea of being too cold, I think, is metaphorical as well as physical. So the, they interpret it physically, like he was in the water, it must have been too cold, his heart gave way. And um, maybe that's physically what happened to this man, that he, he, uh, he couldn't quite cope with the, the coldness of the water and so on. Um, but the way the speaker interprets it is not physical, it's not really to do with that one moment where he's in the water and it's too cold, it's to do with all of the build up to that. So she says, no, 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 it was too cold always, like he always was feeling cold, he was always feeling this kind of, um, you know, the, the sort of difficult emotions that go along with depression. So what she's saying here basically is that other people who don't understand depression might think that there's one thing that sets you off that finally causes suicidal thoughts or causes a you know, serious kind of um, depressive mood. But actually, it's a constant state of being in a constant struggle and it happens over a period of time. It's not just one incident. So she's trying to get people um, to understand that difference because by understanding that we can help better and we can understand better what people are going through. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I'm going to do a little bit on form and structure. I'm not going to spend too long on this one because I think the form structure points are a bit more obvious and I wanted to kind of focus more on the ideas of this one. 
Um, so there's quatrains, there's a sense of regularity with the quatrains, that every stanza is four lines. A quatrain is just a four line stanza. Um, but the line length is irregular within that, and I interpret that as waves. Um, and this is a metaphor for the ups and downs of uh, life, basically, what we experience in life. Um, epizoixis, which is one of my favourite ever words, one of my students taught it me last year, and since then I just use it every time I find it, because I love it. <laughs> it's a very odd word, but it, it basically means where you repeat a word over and over, straight after that word. So like, it's a kind of repetition, but more specific. So she says, no, no, no. And this is emphatic. It's really strongly emotional. And it shows that she she thinks that they got it wrong. They totally misunderstood the whole situation. And that, again, as we were looking at before, the man was constantly cold. He was constantly feeling depressed rather than just in that moment he felt bad. So this is quite an interesting thought that I had on it, but I feel like it's probably true. Um, you might disagree again, feel free to disagree. Uh, but I, I think she feels that the real tragedy of this story of the man is not his death, but the fact that his life was difficult and he couldn't connect. So instead of it being the fact that he died, it's the fact that he was suffering so much in life, he felt the need to die, um, which might just sound really like it doesn't make sense. But if, if it does make sense to you, hopefully you can use that somewhere in an essay, because again, it's a double perspective, it's a kind of higher level way to interpret this poem. So the, the real tragedy is that people go through life having depression, not feeling like they can connect and it drives them to kind of extreme ends um, or behaviours. We talked about the circular structure already, but feel free to read this if you feel like it's going to help you more. And finally, assonance. So there's no full rhyme scheme, but waving and drowning sound quite similar. A lot of words connect in sound, which you should have noticed when you read it aloud. So she's kind of connecting those in sound and also in meaning at the same time. So context points then. These are really important, I think, for understanding the poem. So firstly, it's published in 1957. Attitudes and understanding of mental health, especially depression, has massively come along since then. So we're really lucky that we live in a society where it is more accepted and it's more understood. And um, I think we're a long way off from actually it being like totally, totally understood and totally accepted. But at least things are moving in the right direction. So for someone in the 1950s, it would have been a lot more difficult to kind of talk about your depression than it is now, for example. Not that that belittles anyone who feels depressed now and struggles with that because it's still a very common um, thing to experience. Stevie Smith herself, really interesting person, really unusual life. Feel free to look on, um, I just kind of Wikipedia'd her life. Wikipedia is totally fine for context sometimes, by the way, even if your teachers tell you not. My teachers always hated Wikipedia at school and thought it was rubbish but I personally secretly love it, so I use it a lot. Um, yeah, so Stevie Smith, she had a difficult start to her life. Her dad um, had a kind of shipping business that went wrong and then ran away to sea, so he just like spent most of his time on a boat and she barely saw him. And then um, she was raised by her mother with her sister and then her mum became ill, so she was raised by her aunt. And her aunt was quite a strong feminist who really disliked men. So very unusual background, um, quite difficult upbringing. She also got sick herself. I can't remember what illness she had, but she was um, three years she spent in a sanatorium, which is like a recovery clinic, like kind of like a hospital basically, aged five. And um, it was quite traumatic for her to be split from her mum at that point in her life, because obviously she was very young. So, all of these um, factors in her upbringing, plus possibly genetic predisposition as well, all of that kind of led for her, uh, led to her having her own mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. And her poems explore this. They're a kind of way for her to connect to other people and a way for her to explore um, kind of a deeply sensitive, but not necessarily like 
I don't know not necessarily bad feelings like not everyone who feels depressed or experiences anxiety takes it as an absolute negative um and she tries to explore certain positive aspects or kind of unusual aspects of those feelings as well as just you know the bleakness of them um so she she has a lot of poetry that is about death and a lot of poetry that's about fear and if you're interested in this or you feel like it's personally helpful i really encourage you to read more of her stuff because she's a really interesting poet she was raised in an anglican background um so that's like protestant christian not catholic christian and in her life she kind of like wasn't really sure what she was so she writes essays about this which are quite interesting as well um which you can read but she felt like she couldn't ever commit to being fully religious and definitely embracing her christian background but she also couldn't fully commit to being atheist and some points in her life she's more atheist some points she's more christian um so i would personally call her agnostic which is where you're undecided not because you haven't thought about it <laughs> but because you you know you can see arguments for and against and you find it difficult to come to a definite conclusion so she's agnostic which it does really affect your interpretation of what death is um if you're religious or not or depending on what your religious belief is so uh, i would use that as an analysis like when you're um going into this poem um, and finally, this is a bit of a weird one, but kind of interesting. She quite often drew little sketches, I suppose, to go with her poems. And you can Google the the sketch of um, the the picture that goes along with this poem. It's really unusual. It's like a girl with hair sort of hanging over her face, like half a picture of a girl from the torso up, basically. Um, yeah, it's it's strange because obviously the the subject of the poem is a man. And then there's this kind of drawing of a girl. Um, so it, it, it's kind of interesting how you interpret that. Maybe she sees herself as the girl or something like that. Um, so yeah, as final, finally, as we do with all our scribbly poetry lessons, I've just given you lots of themes here and I want you to just kind of like go through and think about how would you talk about the way in which the poem relates to these themes and what is the final statement or message on them. So um, the themes are what you're gonna get an essay question on if you get this in your exam. So it's always good to kind of just do a bit of extra work at the end and uh, unpick those. So hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson and you're not feeling too down <laughs> about it. And hopefully you agree with me that there's a lot of positivity as well as negativity here and that it's dealt with in quite a sensitive way that opens up our appreciation for kind of friendships and um, and relationships and it makes us feel kind of like more positive and that it just made me want to help people more when I read this poem and, and try and kind of be a, a nicer force in the world, which I'm always trying to be anyway, but it just made me even more like that. So hopefully you have a similar reaction and you're not too down <laughs> after reading this one. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening and hopefully you enjoyed the lesson or found it thought-provoking and I'm sure I'll see you soon in one of the other Scribbly classes.